Good morning. Uh, here we have George Tedropoulos, a managing partner at Fangate Asset Management in Toronto. Uh, Ruth McMorrow, president of enterprises at Parsons Corp in New York. And John Tanieri, the head of infrastructure and project finance at MetLife Investment Management in New York, in New Jersey, actually, sorry. Uh, so I'd like to start off um, with, um, well, the World Economic Forum estimates uh, that the world in underinvests in infrastructure about at around $1 trillion per year. Uh, infrastructure spending not only improves convenience and safety, but also productivity as poor roads and delayed flights hold back economic growth. Canada invested $58 billion in infrastructure via public money and $25 billion via private money last year, according to Statistics Canada. Uh, this represented an increase of 37.4% versus 2009, the first year of available data. Uh, while public investment infrastructure rose 0.8% last year, private infrastructure investment declined 1.6%. It's a small decline, but still a decline. Why did that happen? And, uh, and what are the infrastructure needs in Canada right now? I pose the questions for the three of you. <laughs> so um, I guess I'll start. Um, so you know, Canada has been really on the forefront of infrastructure investment. And I think we've seen Canada adopt a PFI model that was um, growing and, and really took hold in the UK and has really taken that model and, and developed it into a great 3P market. Um, having said all that though, Canada still has some challenges moving forward. I think when you look at the infrastructure gap, it's probably anywhere from 200 to 300 billion dollars currently. And when we look at what's going on in Canada, um, we've seen a change in the 3P market, so we've seen some evolution take place. Um, but there is still a growing infrastructure gap. Um, and so the question is, how do you go out and solve that gap? What do you need to do to mitigate that growing gap? If you think about the late 1950s, Canada was probably investing somewhere in the neighborhood of 3% of their GDP in infrastructure. And currently, it's, it's less than a half a percent. So that gap continues to grow. Um, when you look at the municipalities and the provinces, um, they collect probably maybe 40 to 50 percent of the tax revenue, but are responsible for 80 percent of the infrastructure investment. And while they've done a nice job, a recent report that came out showed that you look at some of the roads and bridges in, in Canada alone, um, you know, 50 percent of those are in either poor or very poor condition, and 80 percent of the, that type of infrastructure uh, is, is aging significantly to the fact that it's over 20 years old right now. Um, when you look at some of the water infrastructure sectors, also that needs substantial improvement. Um, all in all, from a Canadian perspective, I would say that about 40% of that infrastructure over the next 10 to 15 years is going to need some type of remediation or some type of incremental mm -hmm. capex to move that forward. Uh, just to put things in perspective, if you think about the U.S., uh, the U.S. infrastructure gap is pretty well known. Uh, it's quite large. And um, there was recently a, a survey done of the uh, 28 OECD countries. And to give you a, an idea of some of the con countries that were in that top third, you know, Japan, Netherlands, Denmark, these are countries that obviously have a very small infrastructure gap that are investing uh, a fair amount of their GDP in infrastructure. Canada since 2000 to current uh, 2019 probably ranks around 10th and has really steadily improved since the, uh, the early 90s. So it was probably sitting somewhere around 20th out of all 28 OECD countries. But it continues to improve, um, but there's significant uh, headroom uh, for infrastructure investment in Canada, both on the public side and on the traditional private side, which MetLife invests in. Yeah, and I think I'll take a more global approach. I agree with everything that John has said. I think the critical infrastructure issue is always funding. If you want to have private investment, if you want to have public investment, where does the money come from? Um, you know, people talk about, well, let's bring in private folks, they can do this. Well, they're going to need to have a rate of return. So we need to come back to fundamentally, how do we sort of tie infrastructure to a payment or a revenue stream? Um, and I think particularly in the Canadian market, you have seen sort of 
reluctance to what I'll call demand-based revenue sort of approaches. So, um, you know, toll roads in the Canadian market with the exception of the 407 and, and maybe in some ways some would argue because of the 407 experience do not tend to get traction. You have some tolled bridges in the, in the Quebec market, but, you know, compared to other countries in Europe, in the U.S., where toll roads are, you know, very much a, a way of communicating and, and transporting people. Um, and, you know, I would say that becomes a critical element in how you get that investment in. I think also, and I'm going to probably get booed by maybe some of our um, investment folks, is, you know, the other part is even in the P3 market in Canada, we're seeing uh, the decision to sort of limit the amount of private investment in deals by bringing in, you know, milestone payments, substantial completion payments, and they're trying to sort of bring in the, the lowest overall cost for that project. But in doing that, um, some would argue that you're limiting private investment, the innovation, some of the improvements you'll get with that. So I think both of those are drivers in, in why you're seeing some limited investment. Uh, but, you know, as John highlights, you know, the, the trend is definitely improving. Uh, you know, we've seen a number of capital plans, not only at the federal level coming forward, but at the provincial level that are putting significant investments in. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so our perspective, coming from a, uh, an investor, we're a um, private equity fund investor that invests in infrastructure, both in Canada and the United States. Um, so we're always looking for an opportunities to invest in private, well, private capital. And the reality is, you know, Canada, first, firstly, from an infrastructure perspective, is a quite a small market. Um, secondly, it, it, it's, um, you know, it doesn't like demand-based projects, doesn't really like toll roads. Canadians feel we're overtaxed as it is. You know, we have this thing called the HST, which is 13 points on everything we purchase and it keeps adding up. Um, so generally, we don't like user fees, speaking as a Canadian. Um, next, we have a, it's, our market's fickle because most of the infrastructure is procured by provinces. And depending on who's in power, for example, in British Columbia, we have the new Democratic Party that's in power. They just shut down P3. And British Columbia was a jurisdiction that did a tremendous amount of private infrastructure via the P3 model, availability-based public-private partnerships. Alberta just came, went back into a, uh, say, center-right government from a, well, arguably center-left. We can argue how, how center they are, but they were NDP as well. And again, Alberta was a, you know, Canada's really, the populations live in British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, basically. Um, and um, the only market that we have right now is Ontario. And uh, it's still, you know, robust. However, they don't like private capital in, in their infrastructure projects, generally speaking, because it costs more than public capital. So what they're doing is they're procuring billion-dollar hospitals, $3 billion LRT lines. But they're saying, hey, as you build it, we'll just keep, we'll fund public capital in, in the form of, as Ruth said, milestone payments, reducing the amount of private capital in the, in the project. So you have a $3 billion project, you may have literally $500 million of private capital. So everything is shrinking. So as a firm, we've had to basically expand and leave Canada because it just, if we want to grow, our growth has to come in the United States. That's, our, that's the natural step for most Canadian firms, come to the US, set up an office, and invest in infrastructure in the U.S. And, and broaden our scope of infrastructure, not just, you know, P3s and, you know, and the, and the Americans do, we see a lot more flow here with demand-based, sort of hybrid infrastructure where you have sort of an availability-based type of payment, which is sort of a, like a rent, but then you get capture most of your equity, a lot of your equity return from um, the uh, other sources of the project, such as uh, private leasing, et cetera, or private development. Uh, very interesting, George. Um, 
you as a Canadian like is looking to invest more in the US, but you guys, US based, are looking to invest more in Canada. So what attracts you to Canada? I mean, what do you think is the flip side of what George said? <laughs> sure. So um, yeah. you know, George is an equity investor. We're we're a debt investor. Just uh, so for clarification, uh, MetLife is an, an ALM shop, an asset liability management shop. Um, we have some short dated. Uh, liabilities on the front end of the curve as a result of a large guaranteed investment contract business. And then we have some actual long dated uh, fixed liabilities as a result of a number of liabilities that we sell. Um, and while we're there, we're somewhat barbelled, we're asymmetric as well. So uh, a, a huge amount of our liabilities are in the long end of the curve. And so infrastructure, given its long duration, matches up very well. Um, when we look at opportunities in Canada, I think George is right. If we take a look at what's gone on over the last five years, you've seen more non-3P transactions occur in Canada. So more in the midstream space, the renewable space, and that's where we've been participating. Um, when you look at where we see opportunities moving forward, um, we think it's a mix of 3Ps, but primarily on, on the midstream pipeline space, renewable activity, because when you take a look at what Canada has moving forward to it, I mean, I, I think of it more holistically where infrastructure is there, one, to help support the economy as it grows. There's also a growing green initiative, obviously, as we see with a no number of renewable investments. And then fundamentally, there's also a growing social infrastructure platform that needs to be sustained. So we see opportunities in Canada along those lines. However, I will say, in 2019, it's been very hard to invest, not only because there's been less opportunity, but also as a natural U.S. liability company, uh, we have to swap everything back to U.S. dollars. And so given that most of the 3Ps trade relatively tight, and when you swap them back to USD, it's made it very difficult for us to basically match our liabilities with that type of funding. Are you having the same issues, Ruth? No, actually, I think we're in a sort of different position. So. Um, Parsons Enterprises is what's called the, the development P3 equity investment arm, project finance arm of, of Parsons. And we're what you would call a strategic investor. So we make investments using our own balance sheet in support of our core business, which is design, engineering, and constructing infrastructure. So we become involved in projects from an equity or development perspective when there's a good core underlying business opportunity for us. And that really does attract us to the Canadian market because we do see a, a, a steady stream, maybe not as steady as it has been in prior years, of what I'd call ready projects coming to market. Um, we have good partner relationships in the Canadian market that make it advantageous for us. Uh, about 25% of Parsons revenue actually is generated in the Canadian market. So although we're a US-based company, have a significant presence in the Canadian market. Uh, both people-wise and opportunity-wise. What really attracts us to the market as an investor there is um, really what we see as the depth and breadth of the market. So we get to play in, in a couple different ways, not just as the investor, but as a designer, constructor. Sometimes we'll even advise on the client side. So there's lots of opportunities for us. Um, in general, and I'll, I'll leave it there, we won't get into the details, we generally like the risk allocation process. Um, we like the idea that there's market precedent. So when you go into a deal for us, these deals take you know two to three years to bid. Um, you know, so for example, this morning, we delivered along with our partner Fengate a technical proposal in Nova Scotia for a P3 project that will uh, hopefully complete the bid next month with the financial submission. But we like the idea that we have market precedent. We know what we're getting into two years before. We know what the deals largely are going to look like. We'd probably like a little bit more opportunity to, to break from market precedent when the, the project nature itself requires us to do that. But that, along with sort of established procurement policies and strong underlying credits, give us comfort. Like Fengate, we do a lot in the US market as well. The US market is a little bit Let's just say it, it, there's a series of sub-markets. Each and every state have different approaches, and even within states, different issuers and clients all want to do things sort of their way a bit. So that becomes a challenge. You, you start out looking at an opportunity that's two years out, and you're not sure what it's going to look like. 
So should I be, not, not only just the, the investment of equity or debt providing once you get to financial close, but should I be spending resources and time to develop a bid and put in a bid proposal? Um, I will tell you that when we do our budget, we allocate you know dollars every year to for bid and proposal costs. The cost of bidding a deal in the Canadian market is substantially less than bidding something in the U.S. Um, one is just the the time you have a, a less less confidence in the time. Um, it's a more litigious society, so we usually have a lot more lawyers involved. Um, but the Canadian market for us really provides great opportunities, and that's based on you know, both partnership at the public side. You know, these are people we deal with not just in projects where we invest, but projects we deliver day to day, but also you know, with partners up there on the construction side, on the investment side. And uh, George, uh, institutional investors such as pension funds have been increasingly allocating money to private investments, mm -hmm. such as infrastructure. But it seems that lately it's becoming a bit harder to you know, have the yield they need. Uh, they are either, sometimes pension funds are investing during development or commencement of construction or buying infrastructure assets and improving their performance to try and squeeze these returns they need. And would you say that sometimes for the same kind of returns, investors are taking up stomaching more risk than they were in the past? And if so, how do they manage this risk? So, um, I'm not a fixed income expert but I do observe things. <laughs> Interest rates and fixed income has been historically low for a very long period of time. At the other end, we see asset prices extremely high, whether it's real estate, whether it's infrastructure, anything with a yield, people are paying tremendous prices for and convincing themselves that it's okay to pay those prices. So, you're a pension plan and you've got to match liabilities and you know, fixed income was a nice place to do that. What you're seeing now is pension plans becoming creative internally and replacing their fixed income portfolios. Part of them, not all of them obviously, but partly just to get a little bit more return with, let's just say, super core infra. Um, and, you know, the question is, is that a good move for them? It is if interest rates stay where they are for the next 10 years. Sure, it's a great move. However, infrastructure returns, or infrastructure valuations or asset prices as we value them, follow fixed income. As interest rates go up, our discount rates go up, our, our asset prices come down. It's pretty simple. So the question is, is it a good move for pension funds to now augment their returns, their fixed income book now, not even their equity side. They're augmenting their fixed income book with, let's just say, uh, you know, equity, equity investments. That's what they are. They're equity investments. Yeah, they're safe. Mind you, let me give you an example of whether you think they're safe. But this is Carillion which was a very large construction firm out of the UK. Like Carillion going bankrupt in the UK was the same as Enron going bankrupt in the United States. That was the magnitude of what happened. And they were a counterparty on a bunch of projects in Canada. We were part of equity in those projects and we had to replace them. And unfortunately, when we replaced them as a service provider to one of our projects, the market said, oh, I know they priced it at that price. We need more money. So there is counterparty risk in these types of transactions because and the question is now are you getting a good return at you know a, a p a very uh, uh, i'll give you some returns too because i enjoy throwing out numbers because <laughs> it makes it interesting um a p a public private partnership investment in canada like for example you own a hospital in toronto and you're you've, you've owned it for a long time you're an equity investor and you're 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 getting you know literally the returns are Six and a half percent, because that's what you bought it at. Yield every year. That's your return. I remember when government of the U.S. Treasuries were six percent. Okay, now this is equity. You're getting yield, and is that a good? And that's the market, like gross. That's not even before general partner fees and all this other stuff. 
if you if you not that's a pension fund that wants to go direct into a project. Most pension funds like to have intermediaries just because you know they they're not set up for that kind of investing. So they're probably netting back to themselves. You, you clip up one percent for their for the the general frictional cost of investing. So they're they're at five and a half percent on that investment, and they're taking real counterparty risk. And these are these counterparties are not you know A rated entities or double A rated entities. It's not. These counterparties are triple B, double B plus, and they're getting, you know, and if a counterparty goes bust on one of these projects, which, you know, rarely happens, you know, it's not common, they one did, Carillion, and you have to replace them, you hope that, you know, you can replace them at an economic price. So that's the debate that's really going on. I don't know if, actually, I don't even think it's a debate. I don't know if people are really focused on it. It's just like people are so hungry for yield that they're basically doing things to get that yield without maybe really sitting back and saying, is that the right move? Just to echo George's comments here, you know, from a fixed income investment standpoint, while we're a little bit, uh, we're above in the capital structure, um, we have some of the similar concerns. Um, you know, obviously spreads and, and, and yields are, are drastically lower than they were in the past. Um, when we look at EPC, uh, you know, contractors in general, um, we see uh, a consortium of contractors that are basically across a number of different projects. And we start to wonder, how thin are they? How can they go out and, and, and perform these contracts under a lump sum turnkey EPC contract where they're bearing uh, any of the, the, the overruns? And so we get a little nervous in that standpoint. And then the other risk I would say for a fixed income investor is, you know, there's a lot of liquidity out there and that's what George is pointing to. That's why we're seeing uh, yields and, and uh, come down. Um, but from a fixed income standpoint, one concern that we have is, is loosening up covenants and protections. And so we've seen that also. And so it makes it extremely important for us to take a look at things on a relative value standpoint, not only just in Canada, but globally. Where can we get the best re investment returns for the best structure? And how do we move forward in building a book that we feel very comfortable with, given where we think the market is today? I would say I think one of the benefits you have in the Canadian market on the fixed income side is the, the risk of refinancing risk. Mm. In the U.S. market, you know, most bo most bond deals have a 10-year call at the, the long end, so you can refinance at that point. In the Canadian market, um, you have, you know, the make whole provisions, which effectively don't preclude it, but make it much more difficult for uh, refinancing a project debt. And that, that creates a scenario, which I think is very interesting. So you have the debt assuming the long-term debt is almost always in the bond market, which effectively is locked in its return at the front end, doesn't change at all when the project gets de-risked. You probably get, you get a bump in rating, so actually your, your all-in metrics improve, where the flip is happening on the equity side. Once something reaches completion mm -hmm. and goes through usually maybe a small warranty period, the opportunity, as George was referencing in the market, to sell that equity and create a significant upside is there. So you have very different metrics in the same market, one of which is protected, the other of which is um, a little bit more in flux. And we're seeing you know, on the client side, meaning the public sector client, um, people getting more focused on how can, I, how can I ensure that the private party I contract with in the beginning for this 20 or 30 year project that they're delivering is going to be there for that period of time versus selling off you know in a, in, you know to a, a pension fund who who's looking and you know very do nicely dovetails their investment needs with the project opportunity uh, John have you seen any uh, recent changes in regards to bankers or sponsors in this market? I think George brought up a relevant point from our side We're seeing a number of the Canadian infrastructure sponsors the equity side actually come down to the US where there's more opportunity We're, we're seeing that in general um, And with uh, I would say a, a 3p market in the US. That's still very much in its infancy um, that seems to be uh, an option for a number of the sponsors where they can grab a little extra yield. And, and from our standpoint, we're, we're able to diversify our, our book. Um, I think that's interesting. The other part of it is uh, we're seeing uh, substantial bidding on projects where you have four or five different equity sponsors bidding on a project. Uh, from our standpoint, we try to provide uh, financing uh, via a tree mechanism where we have 
segregated analysts, legal teams internally within MetLife to help support those trees. Um, but that is really the dynamic that we've seen, especially in 2019, less Canadian infrastructure in the traditional 3P market, more in what I would say non-3P side, and then a growing 3P market in the U.S. That is great. Uh, do you have something to add, I was going to say, I think the growing P3 market in the U.S. obviously is challenged by the projects, mm -hmm. but it's also the dollar ticket amounts that investors can write. In the, you know, the Canadian market, the equity checks tend to be to the smaller side. U.S. market, you have opportunity to put bigger chunks of capital to work. Uh, thank you so much for the panel. <laughs>